But after watching the last four videos on the fairies between Port Sharon and Sarnia, you thought we were pretty much done with fairies by now. But we're not. Because Black River didn't always have bridges going across. It. And if it didn't have a bridge, what did you need? A ferry. In 1824, the St. Clair County Court uh, issued a license to Gene Desnoyer to maintain a ferry across Black River. The situation with bridges was much the same as streets and highways back in those days. The community at large could not afford to build a bridge, and the traffic itself paid for the ferry. Originally, Mr. Desnoyer operated a little canoe ferry, just transporting people back and forth across the river in his canoe, but obviously he expanded his business. I found uh, the rates that they were charging, and uh, obviously he needed a bigger uh, ferry to use those rates. Although by that year they were on American currency, or should have been, it would appear that uh, the posted rates for the Black River Ferry were still in English currency. Uh, the rates authorized to be charged were each person, six and one quarter cents, and of course one quarter cent was a coin called a farthing. Man and horse, nine cents, horse and carriage, one shilling. Most small river ferries were cable ferries. They had one continuous cable going overhead, and they had secondary cables uh, going to that cable. On the overhead cable, uh, there was a pulley there as attached to the secondary cables, and then as the cables came down to the ferry, it went through another pulley like this. This would have been attached to the deck of the ferry. And the cable was attached to a windlass or a winch, and uh, they cranked their way across. They quite often they used the current to take them across too, but the current in Black River wasn't that great, so most of it was uh, physical labor. If the ferry was big enough, of course, they would have had a mule do it. If you're wondering about the cable interfering with the shipping in Black River, uh, that's easy. There was no shipping. Keep in mind, in 1826, this was primitive Port Sharon, very primitive, not at all like the pictures you've seen so far of Port Sharon. Here's how a first-hand account was explained in 1826 of what Port Sharon was like. The only inhabitants of what is now Port Sharon were John Riley and his wife, half-breeds, who lived in a block house of two rooms on the south bank of Black River, a little above what is now known as Military Street and a Frenchman who occupied a frame house just south of Riley's. On the north side of the river stood a board shanty occupied by a man who was a graduate of some eastern college, a man of culture but who disappointed in love or some other such affair had strayed into the wilderness and was then following the trade of a cooper. A cooper is someone who made barrels. The original bridge probably never would have been built except for Congress and the military. The military had a fort, Fort Detroit at Detroit, and of course they also had Fort Gratiot near Fort Sharon. During all the time since Fort Gratiot had been built in 1814, it was practically isolated in the wintertime. A trail connected it with Black River and the settlements along St. Clair River. But if occasion arose for bringing the munitions or supplies and a hurry, it would have been practically impossible. The importance of connecting Detroit with Fort Gratiot and other outlying points had been pressed upon Congress for a military necessity by Governor Cass and others. And as a result, an act of Congress was passed March 2, 1827, providing for the survey and construction by the United States of a road from Detroit to Fort Gratiot. In 1826, three men were selected to run a line from Detroit to Fort Sharon, or actually to Fort Gratiot, so that uh, they could tell where the road would go, and the road builders would follow that line. And they would put uh, mile posts uh, along the way at each mile, and then they would uh, go through the woods. And it wasn't an easy job. Uh, there was some uh, pretty dense woods there, and mosquitoes. Here's a first-hand account of one of the three describing one of the others in the group by the name of Deacon. He says, 
The deacon was a large, fleshy man, and, it being warm weather, he had divested himself of coat and vest, retaining only his pants and thin cotton shirt to protect him from the hordes of mosquitoes that sought to refresh themselves from Deacon's store of blood. With the aid of punk, flint, and steel carried by one of the party, we succeeded in getting up a fire, but despite the smoke in which the deacon sought to hide from his tormentors, he had a hard time of it. When the three men finally got to the Black River, the line that they had went uh, pretty much along the river and came out right near where the Grand Trunk uh, Railroad Bridge is. As you can see from this Google map that uh, the route that they took pretty much followed the river. And you can see where it exits here, uh, or at least stops at the Black River, uh, where at the boat where the, the railroad bridge is. By 1831, uh, construction had already started on the, the military road from the Detroit end of it. But by then it became apparent that Port Huron was growing and had become a, a good-sized settlement with a main street of its own, which is now Military and Huron Avenue. It became apparent to the people in charge that this route, uh, using the main street, would be an equal advantage to the fort and much more advantageous for the county. The main street, uh, Military and Huron, is uh, indicated by the yellow line. Congress acted in July of 1832, gave authority to make the change and the balance of the road was completed during that and the following year, and the bridge across Black River built, so that in 1833 there was a highway from Black River to Detroit. This was known to folks mainly as Military Road, and hence where we get our name Military Street from. But later on it became known as Gratiot Turnpike or Fort Gratiot Turnpike. It was recognized early on that the thinly settled districts of the state cannot be expected to construct and maintain good roads, nor indeed was it reasonable that they should. For this reason, and in order that the traffic over a road should bear a fair share of its cost and maintenance, the idea of a turnpike or toll road was imported from England, where it was very successful in causing the construction of a large amount of good road in 1843, the Michigan Legislature uh, enacted a bill to let Detroit and Port Huron Plank Road Company take over the military road, and they were going to make a, a turnpike out of it. The purpose of the bill, as we can see from Section 3 here, is uh, for the improvement of the present Fort Gratiot Turnpike from the city of Detroit to the village of Port Huron. It would appear that this was already a turnpike when they handed this over to the uh, Plank Company. And it shows that their responsibility was to uh, lay down good and substantial Plank Road from Detroit to Port Huron. And it went on to tell how this road was supposed to be put down and what was to be used. And the bill spelled out exactly what they could charge on this turnpike, and they seemed to cover every contingency. It says for a score of hogs and sheep, 15 cents. Every wagon drawn with two horses, mules or oxen, 12 and a half cents. For every additional horse, mule or ox, 3 cents. For every coach, pleasure wagon, or pleasure carriage drawn by two horses, 12 and a half cents, and so forth. And it went on to talk about the toll booths and how they were to be uh, built and, and how the toll gatherers were to be appointed and how they should collect from every person using that road. And otherwise, they weren't going to be allowed through the toll booths. And uh, some of the toll booths had gates that came down and some didn't. It would seem that the planking company wiggled out of their responsibility. According to William Lee Jinks, uh, in his History of St. Clair of 1912, he says this about the Plank Roads. In this county, the earliest use of the method was the incorporating of the Detroit and Port Huron Plank Road Company in March 1844, followed the next year by the St. Clair and Romeo Turnpike Company. Evidently, capitalists of that day did not think there was enough business over either of these lines to justify the cost, and nothing was done on either. The same fate befell the St. Clair Plank Road Company. 
There was one road, however, at these early days, which was at least partially constructed and operated for many years, and that was the Port Erin and Lapeer Plank Road Company. And we'll talk more about that in another video. Now I said all that so I could tell you how the first bridge, uh, Military Street, uh, came about. Because without the military road, there would have been no Military Street Bridge. And we don't have a photo of that bridge, but uh, it would have been similar to this bridge right here. Major Henry Whiting of Detroit awarded the contract for this bridge to John Clark, manager of the Black River Steam uh, Sawmill, who in turn subcontracted it to the local builder. The wooden bridge was 22 feet wide and 240 feet long with approaches. It had a 40-foot draw span consisting of two 20-foot leaves raised by a windlass. So we know it wasn't a Basque bridge where the only thing lifting the bridge was the counterbalance uh, weight. We know there was a windlass involved and we've already looked at a windlass uh, when we were checking out the ferries. So there was some physical labor involved here of uh, this either a cable or a rope of some sort going around the windlass and being cranked either by hand or possibly uh, by a mule. And I'm sure there was some type of counterbalance weight to help him lift it. This bridge survived until 1854 when a schooner captain deliberately destroyed it. Captain Stockman, operating a schooner owned by the Black River Steam Sawmill, approached the bridge on a Sunday and signaled for the bridge to open. The two movable wings became locked together and Mr. Shelley, the manager of the sawmill, ordered the captain to remove the bridge as an obstruction to navigation and sent carpenters from the sawmill to do the work. The County Highway Commission tried to sue for the loss of the bridge but lost the case in the courts. I know it sounds like fiction but it's an historical fact. A massive timber bowstring swing bridge was built in 1857 carried Military Street across Black River until 1884. It was constructed slightly downstream, and then it was slid on timber runners and placed over the pier on which it pivoted. The bridge was known locally as the Old White Bridge, perhaps because it was whitewashed or painted white. But I think there could also be another reason. Fort Yarn was divided up into different areas called flats at that time, and the area right uh, at the uh, entrance to the uh, Military Street Bridge was the White Platte. So it's possible it could have been referred to the White Bridge because of that. Or it could have been white. This photo was taken shortly after the bridge was built and you can see it's uh, completely uh, done here. And the roads are being used uh, going across it. And this photo here taken uh, during a a logging drive you can see the lumber in the river but you can also see the pedestrian walkway on the side of the bridge there it gives you a pretty clear picture. The third bridge on the site was an iron prat through truss swing span and it was built in 1883-84 and you can see the opera house there in the background Unlike the previous bridges, we have quite a few pictures of this bridge. This is the first bridge where you see the streetcar tracks going across. And in this one, you can actually see the streetcar coming across. This photo gives you a side profile of the bridge. And here we have a couple aerial views of the bridge, looking down on it. And in this one you can see the wooden frame when the bridge pivot, that's where it would be in position there. In its later years, large signs saying, you'll like Port Huron adorned as portals. Two years after this bridge was built, it was knocked off its pier and April of uh, 1885, when the spring fall caused three ships, the Burlington, the Church, and the Allen, to break loose from their moorings. They smashed into each other and into the bridge, which fortunately was in the open position at the time. 
This bridge suffered considerable damage over the years from ships on the Black River. 1903, the tug American Eagle, towing the barge Homer, loaded with coal, struck the bridge and caused serious damage. Besides the constant threat of a major accident which could close the Black River and Military Street at the same time, the swing span was just simply too narrow. It provided two nine-foot sidewalks and an 18-foot roadway, barely wide enough to accommodate the pair of trolley lines that crossed the bridge. If it wasn't for the city bridges going across Black River, we would have never had some of the wonderful photographs that we've had of the ferries and of the ice jams and uh, Mackinac races. But I think one of the most amazing photos I've ever seen from the bridge is this one right here. Black River was frozen for many weeks in the winter, and it provided excellent skating within a short distance of most residences. And homes of prominent citizens were close to the city center in the early 1900s. The vessels pictured here are in dock for the winter months. And if you look closely, you can see the ice gates on their feet. Here's one more photo I want to show you before we close this video. And this is uh, the folks taking ice out of the river for uh, the ice house. And they would cut it up and put it on the conveyor belt and go into the ice house. Now, you realize, of course, at that time, it was quite polluted. But it wasn't really for ice cubes. It was to put in the ice boxes to keep things cold because they didn't have refrigerators yet. Well, we still have more to look at in the Military Street Bridge, and we'll look at it in our next video.